Good evening and welcome to the Trent Advantage webinar. Uh, I'm Valerie, an enrollment advisor here at Trent, and I'm so happy that you could join us this evening for tonight's topic covering the humanities. Here with me this evening is Dr. Hugh Alton, uh, professor and chair of ancient history and classics. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Uh, in this webinar, you're going to find out all about uh, the various humanities that Trent has to offer uh, and the types of careers that might come out of those programs, uh, as well as you how you can combine some of those degrees. So for instance, uh, humanities and business, we're actually uh, the very the only school in Ontario that offers that option right now. Uh, if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to type them in and we'll make sure to answer them all in the queue uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, Hugh, I'll turn things over to you to get us started. All right, well, thank you very much, Valerie. So um, I'm here uh, today to sort of give you what, what we like to think of as a faculty perspective. Um, we'd like to start off with um, a quotation from my boss, uh, Moira Howes, who's the Dean of uh, Humanities at Trent. And Moira on the screen has uh, put up this quotation, which um, sort of talks about what we think we're doing uh, when we work in the humanities. I think we can simplify this yet further, which is one of the characteristics of humanities people, that we're rather fussy, uh, we don't sort of take things at sort of face value. We like to reinterpret them, to recreate them all the time. And so I think we can sort of take this quotation, which is very eloquent, but perhaps a little bit long, and we can say, this is about communicating critical thinking clearly. And that's what we do. Um, we think very, very hard about issues in the humanities, and then we communicate them, we spread them out, we take these ideas, we move them out to other people, and we do it very, very clearly. And so as a tribe, you know, we're a very eloquent group, but we also, we make things happen. We make things, then we make them happen, and then we spread them and then we share them with other people. And that's the sort of um, you know, ideas that I try to bring into my teaching here at Trent, and all of my colleagues do in a teaching at Trent. So what do we do um, at Trent? We have a whole bundle of um, undergraduate degrees. Um, many of these are going to be fairly familiar to you. We have classics, Canadian studies, new program recently you were brought online, communications, critical thinking, which is just practicing the base skills that we do. Um, cultural studies, which we don't always do at high school, but think of this very much as this sort of combination of media plus uh, English and literature. Um, English lit, you're, you're very well aware of that. Um, French, gender and women's studies, which again is something not always done as thoroughly as it could be at high school, but we're very, very good at that tr at trend with strong links to sociology. Um, history, which is part of uh, my training. Journalism, a new program, and we're very, very keen on that. Um, media studies, very, very popular. Um, indeed, and this is one of the uh, programs for the future. And then philosophy, again, one of my personal favorites, because these are the people who are trained to think, think really hard and think really clearly. And when I've got a problem at the office, I'm not able to sort it out myself. Who do I go to to actually get some advice on how to think clearly? It's always to a philosopher. So there's a great deal of value you know, to that. So that's uh, sort of a whole bundle of programs um, that we've got. Um, but sort of, Really, it's this question of like, why should you come to Trent to do this? Because you can do all of those things that everywhere in Ontario, in fact, everywhere in Canada, if not everywhere in North America, or in fact, across the planet. What is it that makes Trent special? And one of the things I think that makes Trent special is that we care about the students. And it's easy for us to say that, and probably every university that you're in contact with will be saying that sort of thing. Um, but it's one of the things that I sort of test every time I get a new bunch of students who come in at the beginning of the academic year. And I say to them, oh, why did you pick Trent? And they tell me the reasons why they did, which are as many and varied as they are as individuals. Um, but often they'll say, you seem to care about students. And I say, is that really true? And they often say, yes, it is true. And I can remember my first year at Trent, perhaps a decade or so ago, um, I was sitting down at a seminar um, and I was chit chatting with a student at the beginning of the seminar. And I said, where are you from? And he said, I'm a transfer student from another university. And I started talking to him. And at the end of this conversation, he said to me, no professor has ever talked to me before. And I just thought that was one of the saddest stories I'd ever heard. Because, well, not quite, that's probably exaggerating a bit, but it's sort of quite sad because I like talking to students. And probably over the course of the next hour when I'm answering questions and talking with you about this, I'll start telling stories about people. 
and that's one of the things about the humanities humanities is about people it's who we are who we were and who are we going to be and i very much like the small classes i like talking to students um, I was walking through um, the building I work in uh, yesterday morning and I ran across a student from last semester um, and I just stopped and talked to Mark and I said like you why are you waiting outside this office and we started talking you know to each other because that's what we do so when we say individualized attention we really do mean that and it's a great joy to know many of my students by the first name and to have them call me by the first name it feels like to be the way to go so small classes and um, we do care about students um, lots and lots of different ways to have the educational experience we're very very keen on experiential learning we're all very very conscious that you come to university to learn stuff but also so that you can enter the world of work and it bothers all of us the idea that you you think that you're, you're not going to get a job you know, in the future. And this is absolutely not true. Um, almost everybody who goes to university in whatever field of study they take goes on to get a job and to get you know, quite often many jobs and many interesting jobs. And all of that starts here, starts when you come to Trent. Um, and we find lots of different ways for you to give you experiences of the world of work, of the world of learning and continuing to challenge yourself and to provide value and useful stuff whereas internships, uh, working in the community, studying abroad, and I very much enjoy taking students of mine abroad to work in Turkey. Um, that's something I do on a regular basis, and it's great to have joy to that. For me, helping them understand another culture um, and understand the culture at another time. So these are the sort of things that we, um, we, we feel that we do. And one of the things that I try to do in my teaching constantly is explain to people what are the skills that we're learning. Um, I teach Roman history and I spend a lot of time talking about Roman history, but also reminding the students from time to time what are the skills that we're practicing here and how would they have applicability when you have entered a world of management, a world of business, a world of making things change and making things happen. So in one of the sort of examples of this, um, I mean, I've taught a lot of people over my decade um, at Trent, um, and I teach as a Roman historian. I'm particularly interested in the world of the late Roman Empire. So that's a world from the third to the seventh centuries AD, a world in which we take a Roman world and watch it sort of transformed into a Christian Roman world, and what those changes mean to that society, um, how it changes over time and how it changes over space. But as I'm doing that, um, many of my students um, you know, are learning, they're thinking about stuff, and then they go on and they do different things. And what we have on the screen here are a whole bunch of you know, jobs that people that I've taught have gone on to do. And so there are a few postgraduate students in there that have gone from the world of being taught about Roman history into studying Roman history professionally as postgraduate students. Um, and I'm thinking particularly about people like Robbie at the University of Toronto. Um, but then when we talk about sort of doctors, you know, I can remember Helen, who went off to be a doctor, um, Karis, who became a security manager, um, and then um, Nicole, the accountant, field archaeologist, um, Basil and um, somebody else whose name is escaping me at the moment. Uh, Basil, after his time as a field archaeologist, went off to become a naval officer. Um, then his student, uh, Dwayne, became librarian, um, human resource manager. I can remember when I wrote the list, I can remember who that was. That will come back to me uh, in a moment. Um, teacher um, in the sort of UAE. Um, who's sort of, you know, now married and has children, and that's sort of great sort of joy to see her occasionally. And then the curriculum developer, uh, Stevie, um, who's sort of, you know, kept in touch and has been working in northern Canada, um, in to, to, um, working with an organization helping train indigenous teachers um, in sort of curriculum development. So there's a whole bunch of things um, that students that I've taught, and I've taught all of these people Roman history, um, have gone off to do things that have absolutely nothing to do with Roman history, and yet they're employed, they're happy, and they, they come back and they see me and they talk about what's going on um, in their lives. And they seem to have benefited from the time that they spent um, at Trent being humanity students. So there's a great deal of joy um, you know, in that. So um, one of the other things that we need to mention about Trent um, is the, the joint major 
opportunities. So I'm talking you know, very much as a subject matter expert in the field that I do in Roman history. Um, but there are no pro problems in sort of taking two or more interests and combining them. So it's very, very common at Trent for people to take joint majors. We've got a very high percentage of those. So you could do um, Greek and Roman studies and English, or you could do English and history, as it says on the screen. Um, and you know, this is very, very simple to do. Um, you could do the business admin um, and women's studies or business admin and English or business admin and history if you wanted to do that sort of thing. That's always you know, out there. Learn a few useful skills like spreadsheet management and combine that with thinking critically about stuff. And the business people actually like that because you're smart, you're creative, you know how to get things done and you know how to work with people. And business isn't actually about managing spreadsheets, it's about managing people. And the humanities people are really good at understanding what makes people tick and then expressing these ideas very, very clearly and articulately to people. And then you can also combine a degree in the humanities with anything in social science or science. Um, I taught a course um, jointly with the uh, computing program a couple of years ago in which the students were designing um, a software project and they used my course on Roman history as the st uh, study for that. So they're building a tool for me to use in classroom that met my classroom needs, uh, but also fulfilled their needs as um, you know, computer science students. And that's really satisfying to see that. And what is you know, great about this is that um, you can do almost any combination. And when you ask a Trent student, what are you taking? You have almost no idea what they're going to do because people keep on coming up with these interesting ideas and that's what Trent is it's an interesting place you get to do things differently um, and not just that um, you now get this all bonus I now sound like a salesman which isn't me but oh, that's what we're asking me to do um, the sort of now it's not just that you get to come here uh, but we're going to pay you you know, to come here and you get 500 bucks you know for new first year students taking a humanities degree and how about that you get to work with me you get to be amused, you get to work in my classroom, and you get paid for it. It's not bad for that. Um, and then you also get this, um, so we're very, very generous when it comes to scholarships and when it comes to bursaries. And Trent really believes in accessibility uh, for education. Um, education for me um, and for all of my colleagues, it's about opportunity. Come here and show us what you can do. And that's what Trent University is, and that's what the humanities at Trent are. So that's what I have to say, Valerie. So now we go to questions. Yes, and actually we've had quite a few questions as you were talking, so that's great. Um, so the first question that came in to us was from Skylar, and uh, Skylar was wondering, uh, can they combine two humanities programs to create a joint major? Um, and particularly, uh, Skylar was interested in English and women's studies, um, so certainly address those, but mm. also just generally about combining I think would be great yeah so that would be you know, this this sort of suggestion sort of can I do English and women's studies absolutely um, very easy to do um, and one of the, the fun things about Trent for me is the using the small size to generate these interactions um, with colleagues in other programs because it's small we all know each other you know, very much so when I'm thinking about English and women's studies I know the chair of the D uh, department of women's studies who's Suzanne and I know the chair of uh, the department of English it's another Hugh um, yeah I know exactly those people and I know who are in their departments as well and so when you're talking about English and women's studies yes there are plenty of people who've already done that so you're not going to be a pioneer in this you're going to find other people with similar interests and it works very well. And um, you could come to Trent in the first year, you'd sign up and you'd take um, two or three English uh, courses uh, for the first year. You'd take the uh, Women's Studies first year courses. And if it turned out that, hmm, after your first year, you think that you'd rather only do one of those, it's a very easy switch. And if it turns out that you'd rather do something entirely different, you also took a philosophy course or a computing course, and that actually turns out really to be what you love, then it's very easy to switch to that too. All you need to do is fill out an online form. You don't need to pay any money. You don't need to consult a faculty advisor. All you need to do is check a box in the online form and you can change. And then you could change back afterwards as well, and it's still very free and very flexible. So the choices there um, are up to you. And one of my colleagues a couple of years ago put together a chart uh, for the sciences showing that um, for every single major in science, 
um, there was somebody taking a joint major with every other program in the human in, in the university and the same thing is uh, I'm sure true of the humanities so for everyone doing English and women's studies there are also people doing English and history and people doing women's studies and history lots and lots of diversity um, across the university yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned um, some other options there mm. because a number of the questions are about double majors um, or major minor, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so Emily, for instance, uh, said that she got in for uh, psychology, so mm -hmm. congratulations, Emily. We're so excited that you got in. Um, and she's looking to minor in humanities. And so um, even that idea of combining something outside of humanities with humanities um similarly mikey uh, is thinking political studies and philosophy and is thinking political studies is probably a social science which it is mm -hmm. um and so is there options to do double majors from outside the humanities with the humanities as well oh absolutely and when you know he asked i mean i've been asked to come to talk about the humanities but the humanities social sciences and sciences they're just organizational boxes that's all um so um is um, politics a social science well yes it is here um is history um a humanities yes it is here but there are plenty of places where history is actually a social science for that so it's all think about what are the degrees um that you're interested in what are the things you want to know about and combine those and the question is can you combine the interest that you have a trend and of course the answer is yes you can so you want to take a single major in psych whether it's a ba or the bsc and then take a minor in philosophy we can do that for you and there's a great deal of joy in offering that. Um, and in fact, when I was teaching um, a course on ancient warfare last semester, um, one of the students, Isabel, was a psychology single major. Um, and yet there she is taking an elective course. And it's a third year course, so quite an advanced one in ancient history. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we do at Trent. Um, and every now and then when we're talking in seminars, Isabel is talking about her specialized knowledge about psychology and bringing that into the discussion. And that made the discussion better for all of us in the room because suddenly we've got somebody talking about something that is not about ancient texts, it's not about ancient behavior, it's how do professionals analyze human behavior. And it's really exciting to bring that in there. And so feeling that you don't know what those combinations are when you start teaching is really exciting. I love that, my students. And I just want to clarify for everyone who is thinking about these joint major options, uh, Faith had a great question around what does it mean to do a joint major? Um, is there more work involved in a joint major? Um, and uh, no, there isn't. Uh, uh, no, absolutely not. And that's the sort of great question that reminds me how much or if you, you know, how, how daunting university is to people that sort of aren't yet there. Yeah. So for us, uh, we tr treat this as an office and it's a very casual sort of place. But there's a danger of us making it look very complicated, not explaining what we're doing. And that's what we're supposed to do as educators is explain what we do. So you know, all these are all good questions. So the double major um, increases the number of required courses that you have to take but it doesn't increase the number of credits that you need to take as a degree. So everyone who graduates from Trent takes exactly the same number of courses, um, but it's what, for a typical uh, humanities degree, is nine or 10 um, undergraduate or full year courses. Um, so, and then for a joint major, it tends to be six or seven and six and seven full year courses in there. So what the joint major will do is reduce the number of electives um, that you have to take to graduate, but it doesn't increase your workload. Great. I hope that that clarifies for everyone. Yeah. And if it's not clear, then do, again, write in or email this or the, the university and someone will get back to you with this. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Guinevere uh, is saying that she got in for English, so mm -hmm. again, congratulations. Um, and uh, she was wondering, how does she do a double major? Right. Um, and so perhaps you can speak to that. Yeah, well, one, one of the great things um, about Trent, again, is it's very small and it's very flexible. So um, you, to be honest, I wouldn't do anything about that now. I just wait until you arrive and then sort it out 
when you're on campus. Um, so you're, you, if you know the courses you want to take for a double major, then in the pre-registration phase, you pick the courses. If, if, for example, you want to do English and um, history, then sign up for some uh, first year history courses, sign up for first year English courses um, in the summer. And then when you get here, just make the adjustments you know, as necessary. Because this is the point, it's a lot easier to go and see the faculty members, go and see the academic advisors, and you may have changed your mind by then you know, anyway. So don't sweat it. And I know it's very easy for us sitting here to say, don't worry um, about it. Um, but this is the advice I give to first year students every summer, year after year, is don't worry too much about it. It always works out. Yes. And um, for all of our students, there's going to be a new student orientation, mm. which will help with, um, you know, how do I register in my courses? How do I pick my major, my minor, my joint major? And what do I need to take for first year? And so all of those questions can be addressed during that, that orientation. And, yeah. and that's a very good time to ask these sorts of questions because a lot of the new student orientation takes place in the summer. It's a little bit quieter. Uh, people have just got a little bit more time uh, to deal with that. Uh, there. And also, new student orientation is a lot of fun. Come see the campus in the middle of the summer and get to know, you know the place that you'll be working at. Um, and I've been asked to do welcomes to the university and new student orientation in the summer. Um, and it's always you know great fun you know doing that, meeting the new students and meeting their parents and sort of seeing what it means to people giving up some of their free time um, to, to investigate the university. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, Guinevere also had some questions around um, funding for humanities students and I mm. think you did a great job of covering that in your last slide and uh, thank you also to Rachel who followed up on uh, on that with a, a link as well so hopefully that answered uh, that question but if it didn't please write us in uh, and let us know if you'd want more information about that um, and, and to note on the scholarship side, I mean, we mentioned the, the $500 Humanities Award, um, but our automatic entrance scholarships start at 80%, um, and with a 90, it's a free tuition scholarship. So uh, if you're looking for something to aim for, that could be it. Um, so we had also a couple of people asking about combining more than two interests. So both Naomi and Sarah have wrote in asking, uh, can I combine three interests and how would that work? Uh, so Naomi specifically thinking cultural studies, uh, women's studies, and sociology. Yeah, um, that started to get complicated. Um, so complicated just means it takes a little bit more, more organization. So the way the, the university is nicely set up the double majors, and you can certainly take you know, the double majors um, and get a minor in there um, you know, if you're really, really organized. But it doesn't stop you pursuing those sorts of interests. And um, in terms of the, the interaction between cultural studies, women's studies, and sociology, there are a lot of what we call cross-listed courses that will count and credit towards uh, gender and women's studies and to credit for uh, sociology, depending on which way you go. Um, and there are a number of faculty who've got joint appointments um, across the university, um, many of them teaching. And there are people um, like my colleague, Momin Rahman, who's a, um, a member of the sociology department, but also teaches courses um, in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies. So we have these sorts of possibilities uh, that are here. And even if you're only taking um, the, the joint major, you can still take some other electives in there and you can pursue those interests if you're doing cultural studies and women's studies. You could also pursue some interest in taking some sociology courses at the same time. And, and so at the end of the day, um, none of these things are likely to matter when it comes to getting a job. Um, as long as you've learned the uh, the critical thinking and the communicating skills, um, employers are far more interested in are you able to make a good impression? Are you able to sound articulate and intelligent rather than worrying about or do you have significant qualifications um, in a humanities field? And the great thing about that means you can do what you want to because it's the being at university and the learning that is the most important thing, not whether you've actually done a second year course in English that read a particular set of novels. Employers are really interested in that sort of thing. They want to know who you are, how do you argue, how do you present cases. Great. Hopefully that clarifies as well. 
Um, so Rachel is, uh, she, she mentioned that she knows Trent's a small school, mm -hmm. um, but realistically, how accessible are professors for sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation and uh, getting involved, that type of thing? Yeah, well, um, you know, I get to the office about nine o'clock every morning and I leave between four and five every morning. If I'm not teaching, I'm in my office when the door is open and that means come and see me. Um, I like to get the phone answered by the second or third ring. Um, I don't always manage that. Sometimes I'm teaching a student, you're in the office, or there's a conversation with somebody who's dropped in, and it may take four or five rings you know, to do that. Um, but accessibility to students is something that we're all very, very keen on. Um, it's one of the things that um, when, when Trent recruits faculty, um, and I've been through this process, I'm recruited by Trent, you know, the, the questions that we're asking prospective new faculty members is tell us about how you do accessibility to students. This is something that really, really matters um, to all of us. And I was reading the evaluations that students uh, write at the end of every course. I was reading those for the work I did last semester. And um, I was very pleased that I scored very, very highly on accessibility. There are a couple of organizational things that I've clearly got some work to do there, but I, mean, I was really satisfied that the students rated me very highly on accessibility because I think I'm accessible and they're telling me that I am. And it's not just your, you have to come to see me, and I'm quite happy to see students after class. Um, and of last semester I was asked to do part of a photo shoot for the university and um, the guy who was planning the shoot said to me, well, you know, um, tell me about student interaction at Trent. Um, and I said, well, how about this? And describe the situation which I'm standing outside the classroom and students are coming up to me asking me questions. And the guy shooting the publicity stuff said, that's terrific. You know, says, and we shot that as part of the video for the publicity. But when we did the shooting, and he said, I was walking around the campus and looking at student faculty interactions, and I could see this again and again. What you were describing is students coming out to faculty after classes or in the corridor and having conversations. When we say accessibility, it's not just you come to me, we also meet each other around campus. And when I had lunch today, I went to the, um, the my departmental office, I heated up my lunch in the microwave, and then I talked to two students, uh, Michael and Emma, you know, over lunch. And we discussed all of your learning a classical language and how that worked for us and how the course was going um, and the problems of actually getting to campus by bus and by car and the snow. And that's the sort of thing that we very much enjoy doing. So I like to think that we're very accessible at Trent. And certainly, uh, I was a student at Trent uh, one day not so long ago, mm -hmm. and that was certainly my experience. Every single one of my professors made an effort to know me by name, mm -hmm. to take an interest in um, not only some of my questions that I might have about class, but even just mm -hmm. having those casual conversations, which right. is really nice. And I think you, you will find that a lot at Trent. Uh, so Guinevere is is wondering about jobs on campus, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if this is something that, that you know uh, terribly a lot about, or do you have any thoughts on... Yeah, there are quite a lot of job opportunities mm -hmm. on campus, and so uh, the two students I was having lunch with, one of them, Emma, works in the departmental uh, office that I'm sort of, you know, in, and there's another student, Adam, who works in there. Yesterday I taught a class and then went to the library to pick up a book, and when I went in there, oh look, there's another student that I'm teaching in a second year class, Leslie, who's working there on the circulation desk. So there are you know, lots of these jobs uh, there, and there are or other students. The student I talked about doing the indigenous uh, sort of uh, teaching um, in the north worked in the registrar's office um, for a while, um, and so sort of, you know these sorts of opportunities will turn up. There are lots of little opportunities for students to work um, at Trent, um, and these. These are great because that cuts your commuting time. And they're often, they're, let's be, let's face it, in the checkout desk at the library, there's often a fair amount of slack time. You know, so when you're not checking books out for people coming there, you can also get a bit of reading done. Mm -hmm. It's the best job on campus. <laughs> I'm always really pleased to see some of my students getting some of those jobs. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, so just to elaborate, uh, certainly there's jobs in. in pretty well every area uh, of the campus. Um, Guinevere was wondering about how and when to apply. Um, all of our students have um, sort of a student portal or online portal that you would sign into and on that is what we call a job board and so all of the um, jobs that are available on campus get posted there when they come up uh, and so you can find out how to apply to each of those jobs uh, right there when you're when you're logging in and so that's where you're you're going to log in to, to find your 
your student email, to maybe communicate with professors. It's this uh, great online place where you really get everything that you need. As far as when to apply uh, for jobs, uh, it, it depends on when the jobs are posted, really. <laughs> and so I usually tell students to, to just continually check. Um, certainly a lot of the jobs do come up uh, for starting in September or for the winter session. So leading up to those times are really great times to be checking that job board. Uh, Faith was wondering about exchange programs specifically for English students, but hmm. perhaps you can speak both to English students as well as generally. Yeah, well, exchange programs are terrific. Um, I've got more experience on this uh, with students who are taking the exchange program coming to Trent. Um, but what is really interesting is watching the connections between the students who have come to Trent um, as foreign students on, on an exchange, and then watching them connect with the Trent students who have gone abroad on exchange students. And one of those was uh, one of the people I was teaching last semester, this semester. You know, John um, did some um, study abroad in Lancaster um, in the UK, and so he really enjoyed that. But it's just interesting watching him then working with Frankie and explaining to her, because he'd already been through those foreign systems, you know what the vocabulary meant so it means that oh, there are opportunities uh, there and there also there are people who have blazed these trails before you're not going to be on your own Trent's got its own office the international program that specializes in helping make these things happen and then one of the routine things that I get asked to do is to look at um, you know, the, the syllabuses and the transcripts for students who've been working abroad and then say, what is that worth in terms of trained credit? So you go there, you get a different educational experience from people with different cultures and different value systems, which is really exciting. And then it gets turned into trained credit when you get back here. So um, this always to be recommended. Yeah, and when I talk to students who've been abroad, they come back and you know, they're just you know, better in every possible way. They've got a better sense of humor. They've learned a lot about themselves, about a different culture. And that reflects then back uh, in terms of their self-confidence. They've mastered another country. Sometimes they've mastered another language. And it's just sort of so good to watch them making those sort of first steps into becoming fully international people, which is really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and just so everyone knows, every one of Trent's programs allows for a study abroad option. It typically happens in your third year. And I did want to address specifically for English, there's um, a paid English study abroad option as well. Um, so some kind of interesting sometimes internships uh, or um, experiences that, that come with a bit of extra benefit there. Yeah, and then English also has a very nice traveling fellowship. Um, that mm -hmm. students can apply for and are watching the students come back and report on this extra opportunity which again you of you the university will give you money to go abroad and do something interesting um, as an English major and that's again a very very exciting sort of um, possibility and HC saying New Zealand sounds fun which I agree um, and perhaps that that could be a place that that you think about uh, doing your study abroad option um, pretty well the um, study abroad office will help you get to wherever it is you want to study so if you have a dream uh, like New Zealand or some other place uh, they can work with you to, to make that happen for yeah. sure yeah I mean I don't know any Trent students who've been to New Zealand uh, but we're one way to all the students uh, that I've done you know, know quite well. Uh, Leslie was in um, Australia a couple of years ago um, as part of a Trent exchange program and she loved that. So if we can get Trent kids you know, down to Australia, we can certainly get them to New Zealand. Yes. Um, Naomi was wondering about co-op options um, and I mean we have lots of uh, internship and placement experiences usually the terminology that we use for those experiential learning the workplace learning um, and certainly many of our programs do offer that um, generally if, if you want to find um, that hands-on learning experience there there's always going to be some sort of option for you whether that's um, a specific laid out internship or placement within your program or a lot of our specifically our humanities programs have a fourth year thesis option where I've known a lot of students to partner with someone in the mm. community to do some sort of research or, or um, placement type experience as well so there are lots of opportunities for for hands-on learning for sort of job 
or career skill mm. building mm. pieces. Um, did you have any specific yeah. well, examples that it, you can it, think of? It's not so much skill building, mm -hmm. it's skill practicing, because we've already been doing those skills for the first years. Um, and the, the point where people are saying, I want a Trent student in my office, is because they want the Trent students because they already know these are going to add value to the what they're trying to do there. So they're not going to say, I want somebody you know, to make cups of coffee. And we're very clear about that. The university co-ops are not all about copy making or doing the photocopying. We want people out there practicing the skills that we've been teaching. And the employers want people that can come in there and do useful work for them. So these things are, you know, are absolutely wonderful for us. I agree. Um, so Rachel had a, a question concerning back to sort of that idea of joint majors, mm -hmm. um, a journalism and international development studies. Right. Um, do you have any um, thoughts on on how that could be done? Or oh yes, so mm -hmm. that's what we do. That's what yeah. the journalism program is about. It's a joint major. Um, you know, uh, so you do a joint major with journalism and IBST, and that's part of um, a link up that we have with Loyalist College in. Belleville, um, and it's a program in which you get the university uh, degree, the Joint Majors Journalism plus IDST, and you get the journalism diploma from Loyalist. So it's an elite program. This year wants the best students you know, to do that. It's hard work, um, but you get an enormous amount out of it. Um, what is so special about this um, is that you finish up um, a loyalist. You start your degree at Trent and then you finish it at loyalist. And people often say to us, well, why do you finish at the college? Why don't you start at the college? And the answer to that is that the college does the hardcore journalism stuff. And I've been down there and done the tour through the green room and through the studio they have there. And so they do the journalism and you know the, the hardcore you know stuff at the end. And you've learned the state of the art skills at the place with these beautiful facilities and they've got lovely connections with people like CBC and what is so good about this is I'm at home watching TV I'm watching Czech news in the evening or CBC and I see someone on CBC um, there and I go that's a faculty member at Loyalist and I know when I was working as part of the journalism program a couple of years ago and that person teaches our students at Trent and at Loyalist and this is so exciting so it's one of those pathways you do the sort of um, you do a lot of the intellectual work about the, um, the degree option you've taken, like IDST at Trent. You finish up with the uh, precise skill management at Loyalist, and then you move into the world of work. And that's why we do it that way. So it's an elite program, but it's very, very rewarding. And we're very excited about that. So uh, Rachel's just. Um sent in a, a quick follow-up mm -hmm. um, for journalism specifically. Um, so can you go back over how it works uh, as far as how the years run? So at what right, point are right. you at Trent and what point are you at Loyalist and that kind of thing? Um, I'm going to talk approximately. Um, mm -hmm. So it's probably better to follow this up uh, with a focused email. Um, can you give an email address they would send it to? Yeah, certainly we'll put that up in the chat. Okay, terrific. Um, so you'll start off and you'll do um, a couple of years at Trent, but with summer um, your semesters at Loyalist. Um, yeah, so you're sort of you know, there's a little bit of commuting, but there's a specialized dorm um, at Loyalist set up in the summer for accommodation, so you don't need to worry um, about that. And you know, talking to the Loyalist students, um, the, the, the Trent students who've done the Loyalist or, you know, camp, I asked one of them once, I said, like, you know, any comments on the facilities? And somebody said to me, it would be better if the TVs weren't so good. You know, in there, it's a very <laughs> nice you know, dorm experience. But the, the students also they go down there and they 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 got on very well with that. And one of the other things that we do is it's not all journalism at Loyalist. We also have Loyalist faculty teaching a course here at Trent. So you get to know the Loyalist faculty while you're at Trent. Uh, doing the journalism, we have Rob Washburn here you know, this year doing the teaching in a dedicated room. We had some very generous support from a sponsor a couple of years ago. So we have the state-of-the-art Mac Lat Laboratory um, in the library, um, which is used for journalism teaching and dedicated mostly um, to that. So, so that's really exciting. So you start off, you do the majority of your work here in the first um, two, two and a half years, and then transfer it down to uh, Belleville and finish up there, um, but, but also finishing up the degree requirements at Trent, often through a thesis and a little bit of backwards and forwards um, there, mostly done electronically in my faculty. Mm -hmm. And our journalism students have lots of support through the department and through their academic advisors on, um, you know, knowing 
how the schedule is laid out and preparing for for going to Loyalist and for being back at mm. Trent and so on. Um, the nice thing too about the journalism program is uh, that you're you're getting both a degree and a diploma in the mm. end. So you're getting two mm. different credentials, which is is absolutely amazing. Um, and so just to, to clarify, um, the first year, typically you're, you're at Trent for fall, winter, then you head to Loyalist for the summer, or you do some, you do a bit of Trent courses online as well. Um, your second year is at Trent, um, and then the summer of second year is the Loyalist six week. It's journalism intensive, um, so you're you're fully immersed in mm. creating and mm. um, and sort of that hands on piece mm. that you were sort of talking about. Um, third year fall semester is back at Trent. Uh, winter semester with Loyalist, and the summer is another six weeks. Uh, intensive journalism time. Um, and then the fourth year is the capstone year. Um, you're at Loyalist College, um, but you're also keeping regular contact with Trent and finishing up some degree requirements there. Yeah, um, um, what is very exciting about this is when I talked to the faculty at Loyalist you know, about that, and one of the questions I asked uh, when I was involved in the program you know, on a day-to-day -day basis was, is there, are there differences between the Trent University students and uh, the students um, at Loyalist? And um, you know, the, the, the guy, Chad, in charge of that said, Absolutely, he said. The technical skills are the same, but when uh, the the when when the students hit a problem, it was the Trent students who took the leadership and bounced back. He said they're the resilient ones, and it was so nice for us to hear that, you know, because that's what we think that we're doing, and to get this of validation from our professional colleagues, say yes, you're building resilient students with imagination. They're not blocked by obstacles; they just do the lateral thinking and they maneuver around them. And that's what we train students to do in the humanities: to take a problem, take it to pieces, and then fix it. And that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Now we don't just follow the manual; we write the manual. And so the journalism program gives us a chance to show that in a practical or sort opportunity somewhere else before you've even graduated. Mm -hmm. A great example of, mm -hmm. of the benefit of having that humanities knowledge for sure. Uh, so Faith uh, is also wondering about uh, joint majors again uh, beginning at Trent with one major and then can she later declare other majors or minors that kind of oh, thing? Oh of course and people do this all the time so when you arrive at Trent in your first semester most students are taking five um, half courses five one semester courses and they'll take five more one semester courses um, in next year so um, for example if you're arriving and sort of you know, in English you might take the, um, your two English uh, credits in the first semester and another one in the second semester but you've still got another seven courses you could be taking so if you thought you might want to do a joint major in English and history or English and philosophy or English and uh, classics then you could actually take sort of all of those courses at the same time and then once you decide oh I like that style more or I like those professors more or, I like that group of students more um, then you could do that so an enormous amount of flexibility um, and so you'll come in you know do one and then expand it as you go is perfectly normal but so if people coming in for two and then either staying with that or sort of going off to one or going to something entirely different mm -hmm. and we're happy either way you know, so as long as you're doing what you want to do, you'll learn better um, and you'll have a lot more fun. And that's sort of really exciting for us. Yeah. And we have lots of students who start and, and they declare one particular major and they, they change their major altogether yeah. or they, they add that joint major. And yeah. so there is that flexibility to sort of try out a variety of things in that first year. And yeah. And this is what we expect. Um, and it's so common for people to say to me, well, I'm not sure what I want to do. And I say, well, I didn't know it might be your age either. I have absolutely no idea. Um, my stepson is uh, 22 now, but watching him go through the college system. And Joe, well, he had no idea what he wanted to do now, uh, you know, to do at do that point. But he sort of got his way through it and he learned an awful lot and had a lot of fun you know, on the way. And that's how it works. Not knowing um, you know, just out of high school, or just in high school is absolutely normal mm -hmm. in there and the university system is built to accommodate that and to give you the choices so almost nothing you do in the first year is irrevocable you can change your mind and or you can sort of pick what you want that's what we expect mm -hmm. um 
I think Rachel says that she's going to follow up with some more of her journalism questions, but I did just want to clarify, journalism is, is one the one exception where when you're doing the journalism program, it's built as a joint major um, and it does have a little bit extra coursework because of that uh, mm. joint program with loyalists. So it's not sort of your typical um, fall winter semester. There is those summer pieces um, so that it is a, a bit of uh, a bigger workload in mm. that sense. Yeah, it's it's a bigger workload, but you get a degree and a diploma in four years. And we also we help you through uh, with the, 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 the tracking on that. And one of the things that happens is that all journalism students in their first year go and see an academic advisor right at the beginning to make sure that you're given focused advice about you and the degree choices that you've chosen you know, to make sure that you're on track. So we know it's sort of a touch more complicated than other programs, but it's an elite program, so it's going to be a touch more complicated. And we help you through um, with this. Mm -hmm. And typically those summer pieces are six weeks long and so um, they'd more so be sort of end of May, June, maybe into July depending on when they decide to start them but uh, usually all of our students have August off even if you are studying through the summer. Uh, so if you're thinking of uh, you know summer jobs that mm -hmm. kind of thing there's still some opportunity there. Um, Rachel was also wondering earlier about when the new student orientation is and I'll say um, typically they happen in the summer before you start in September and you'll get lots of communication as to when those orientations are and how to sign up and where to go and all that great stuff so uh, don't worry too too much about that uh, uh, you shouldn't miss it we'll hopefully get yeah. that word out well yeah. and we did we typically do several new student orientations don't we we do yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we'll do some in the summer leading up um, or for some of our students who are maybe coming from further away um, and just can't imagine manage coming in the summer um, there's of course more orientation in September when school starts um, and lots of time uh, when you first start in those first couple weeks to even change your mind, change mm. some of your courses, uh, you know, you'll want to sit down with an academic advisor and make sure that you're you're making the right decisions for, your, for yourself. Um, so don't worry too much about that. You will get some more information uh, leading up to the summer and September about orientation dates. Uh, so Emily uh, was interested in that 90% free tuition scholarship, which is awesome, and um, what to maintain to keep it. So if you're finishing uh, in, in grade 12 with an overall eight, uh, 90%, um, you will be giving the, the free tuition uh, guaranteed for your first year. So you won't ever lose that first year tuition. Um, as far as maintaining it through your second, third, fourth year, you would need to maintain the 90 once you're at Trent. Um, now I know that can be a bit laborious, um, so we won't leave you hanging if you drop down a little bit. Um, anyone sort of maintaining above an 80 would still receive scholarship in their second, third, fourth year, so on, um, or you know within the 85 to 90. Um, it would just be a different amount. Um, so if you dropped to the uh, anywhere from 85 to 89 uh, percent, you'd be looking at uh, 1,500 in your second year. And if you dropped between the 80 and 84 percent, you'd be looking at a thousand dollars for that second year. So um, not absolutely nothing, um, <laughs> but but maybe not quite that that free tuition all the way through if you're not able to maintain. So, um, just work as hard as you can, and uh, and hopefully we'll be able to reward you for that. Um, now, uh, HC had some very specific course. Um, question uh, about philosophy and whether that might cover mythology and spirituality and 
perhaps you might know about that. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, you may be better off um, emailing the Department of Philosophy uh, directly um, with these precise questions. And, and the chair of the department um, is somebody that I see two or three times a week. He's very friendly, very accessible, and be delighted um, to get an email asking these sorts of questions. In terms of mythology, the philosophy program doesn't deal with that directly, but my program, the um, Ancient Greek and Roman Studies, um, you know, deals with that and uh, so we teach uh, Greek mythology on a regular basis and that's all part of what we do and I bring that into my classes and the heroic background so Greek history and Roman history is a large part of what I do. Spirituality, I'm going to go slightly academic on you and say that's quite a complicated term. Um, so you know, all of my colleagues in philosophy are able to talk about aspects um, of that, but I think it requires, you're asking a detailed question to which I'm not going to be able to answer that. So if you email Byron uh, Stoyles directly, um, who's the chair of philosophy, um, then that will give you sort of uh, answers to that. And um, you can say to Byron that I told you you to email him about that. Um, be very receptive to that sort of thing and you know, we always like as faculty to start engaging with students or early on um, in the process because that tells us that you're keen you're enthusiastic you're a self-starter you've got your act together and that tells us that you're the sort of person that's all we want to have at the university so we're really enthusiastic about these sorts of detailed questions mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that. Um, sorry, I'm just actually going to backtrack a little bit, uh, <laughs> eating my words here from uh, that scholarship question about maintaining the 90. Um, so, revised answer. Uh, if you come in with the 90% um, and you maintain between the 80 and uh, 85 in your first year, uh, you'll actually receive 2,500. So uh, more than I originally said, which is good news, uh, when you're going to get a revision anyway. Uh, and if you come in with the 95 originally and have 80 in your first year, um, then you would still receive the 3,000 in your second year. So again, a jump from, from the last one. Um, but I think moral of the story is if you come in with the 90 um, and you, your marks do drop down, there will be still something for you provided you're within that 80 mark. Yeah, and let's just uh, focus again on the uh, the bottom line that's on the screen in front of you. That is that, that Trent as a university is very very generous in respect to the uh, the money it gives out to scholarships and bursaries. So it's not about the details of the scheme. It's the fact that you know, Trent believes in students and manages the undergraduate experience very very aggressively and very strongly. That's the important point that we want to get over. Not worrying quite as much about five hundred dollars here or five hundred dollars there, which means an awful lot to all of us when we're very very young and when you get to the other end of your career and you're looking back from the age of 65 70 you're going to be focusing on the time you spent at Trent not about the money that's the important thing for all of us don't age yourself too quickly though <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had some questions just follow-up questions um, from Faith and Emily around how we calculate those averages and it is your admissions average so we calculate your admissions average on your best six for U or M credits. Um, so it's always based on that admissions average. And uh, we'll let you know when we communicate your admissions to the university. We'll sort of follow up with more information along the way about those scholarships and what you're eligible for as well. Um, I did want to point out mm. to you, Hugh, that um, Faith and Rachel and perhaps a few others have made some comments along the way while we're answering these questions mm -hmm. about this webinar being great and that they're so happy that they're choosing Trent and um, and it's making them want to accept Trent. And we're so happy that you feel that way and um, and we're hoping that you do accept Trent. And so thank you for those, for yeah, those comments. Thank you very much. We're really excited by that. Um, so, uh, Rachel had a follow-up uh, for when I was telling you about uh, being able to switch your major when you come in uh, to the fall. And, um, of course, there are always uh, deadlines that come with those things. But I think if you're within your first couple weeks, you're going to be safe. Um, and the best thing to do is to speak with an academic advisor as soon as possible if you did think that you might want to switch things up. Um, switching your major can actually be done really at any time. Mm -hmm. It's when you're switching courses that you want to be registered in that you want to be um, thinking about those deadlines. 
and um, just wondering where I'm at as far as questions go. There's one about um, can any program do the tuition exchange abroad program? Um, and I'm not 100% sure exactly what this question was getting at, but I'm maybe trying to answer it in a couple different ways. Um, so when you're doing a study abroad program, the nice thing is, is that you're going to be paying um, Trent tuition fees. So there might be higher tuition fees um, at the university that you may be studying at abroad, and quite often that is, is the case. Um, because they would consider you an international student um, and so that's a nice benefit um, and then certain I think what we were getting at before is, is certain departments have um, funding for students who do want to do those exchanges and so it may depend on the department itself um, but our study abroad office also offers um, a variety of funding options for students who are wanting to study abroad and wondering how to fund those. Um, and so best to always speak with um, someone from that study abroad office early on if you are thinking um, of going abroad and seeing what's available to you because they do want to make it accessible um, uh, to, to be able to do uh, for any student. Yeah, and that's the whole point by why we have a Trent International Program Office that we sort of set this up and we put people in there because we're in, really interested in sending our students abroad and having others of foreign students come to us to increase the diversity of our classrooms. And so it's really good for me as an instructor to have many people coming in from lots of different backgrounds, um, not just people from Ontario or people from Canada or from North America, but from further afield. And in the same way, it's it's just good for your uh, colleagues of mine abroad to you know, have some of our students going to their universities. And as Valerie says, the, the tuition, you pay the same tuition, um, whether you're here at Trent or somewhere else, um, because you know, that's the way the exchange programs work. So there's no cost to you in terms of tuition. It's just the same tuition that you pay here. Um, and we just all work it out amongst the institutions um, by virtue of these exchange agreements. Right, what's the next question then? Um, I think this is the last one that we have. Uh, it's from HC, and uh, he's wondering about students who are requiring accessibility services. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you have any notes on that? Um, yes, um, mm -hmm. and for, for a start, this is a legal requirement, um, so we must do this according to the uh, AODA um, your, um, materials. Um, every uh, faculty member and every teaching assistant and every staff member goes through a regular training for AODA uh, requirements. More importantly, it's a moral imperative that we do this, that we have to treat everybody individually and equally, and we provide opportunities uh, here for people learning. So we have a very strong student accessibility um, office, which sends out uh, or uh, sees people who may need you know, assistance, and then sends the faculty uh, details of any accommodations that are required, and faculty are required to uh, work with the accessibility um, office and the, the students to make sure that everything is accessible. How this works out depends so much on individual needs. Um, it's very, very common for me to be approached by students and asked, is it okay for me to tape um, lectures or can they have or, or digitally record them or is it okay to have an extension for um, a paper? And it's a great joy to work with students in terms of getting students where you want to go. And that's our job here, is to help you be successful. And so if you have a couple of those sort of challenges, um, then we help you work through those. It's a legal requirement, more importantly, it's a moral requirement. And that's what we do. So there's a strong office there and I encourage you to get in touch with them early on in the process. And then they'll carry it forwards from you um, mm -hmm. at that point, so. And I certainly always encourage any students, especially if you have uh, any sort of documented uh, accessibility requirements, uh, to reach out to the Student Accessibility Services Office. Um, perhaps we'll, we'll put up their website or contact uh, on, on the webinar here for you as well. Yeah. Um, and then those materials are also included um, in every syllabus for every course. There's a section about the accessibilities um, that we put in there because that's something that Trent is very, very keen on doing, making sure we maximize the opportunities for every single one of our students. Certainly. And I don't think we've 
had any question any more questions recently so I think we're we're gonna sign off for the evening mm -hmm. I do hope that uh, everyone who joined us to tonight can join us in person sometime um, perhaps at one of our um, upcoming tours plus dates in February so February 3rd and February 5th on both our Peterborough and Durham campuses um, as well as our March open house that's coming up on uh, the 16th at our Durham campus and the 18th on our Peterborough campus. Uh, the open house is really a great opportunity to be able to sit in on some mini lectures, get a feel for the types of programs that are available, talk to some more professors mm -hmm. in different departments, students in different departments, get a feel for their experience, as well as get more information on those student services that we talked about, like accessibility services, um, like the scholarships and awards, so learning more more about that uh, while you're here. So I do hope uh, that some of you can join us for those opportunities uh, and see our beautiful campus. Right, yes, terrific. Thank you very much and look forward to seeing you in the future at Trent. Thanks for coming. Bye.